I was saying to uh, uh, Slavo behind closed doors here that I never know quite what kind of woman to be in front of him. And it's really, it's very, very uh, uh, intriguing. Um, but anyway, I, I want to, I want to be, uh, um, I want to tell you how happy I am here to be here at Cooper Union. And I thought we were going to be in the old building, which would have honored me even more because it was on this stage, uh, that is the old stage, that uh, Victoria Woodhull spoke. Uh, and uh, she was in, in uh, some sort of camouflage in the audience, and she le leapt on the stage to give her advocacy of free love. And she was arrested on the spot with obscenity charges, but she's an extremely interesting woman because she joined the first International Working Man's Association, and then, of course, that great bourgeois Victorian uh, um, man who wasn't he sleeping with his housekeeper called Karl Marx uh, would not have her and the Free Love group because they were uh, against this. Uh, but really, what she did that was uh, bad was that she. There was a case of Henry Ward Beecher, married minister and anti-slavery advocate who did not support labor and who had an affair with a friend's wife. And of course, he got off scot-free. Uh, and the friend's wife, Elizabeth Tilton, lost her job and was excommunicated. Uh, uh, so that's kind of an interesting uh, piece of history. And I'm big on history. Um, OK, so then the next problem I have is that I I'm increasingly uh, concerned with communist in the title. And I know I have no right to be here unless I get re-educated and feel comfortable with communist. But I keep kind of throwing out the U and putting in an O and then coming up with this horrible neologism called communist. Uh, but I think that's the one I feel more comfortable with. But we can keep that in abeyance. We can keep them sort of both in the air. Um, so anyway, the title of this talk is supposedly a communist ethic or a communist ethic, and it is uh, not very much about religion, but maybe it is, and maybe it's just plain heretical, because I start with this claim that politics is not an ontology. The claim that the political is always ontological needs to be challenged. It is not merely that the negative is the case, that the political is never ontological. As Badiou points out, um, a simple negation leaves everything in place. Instead, what is called for is a Feuerbachian reversal of the negation, that the ontological is never political. So instead of S and not P, the political is never ontological, the ontological is never political. And it follows from this, and this is again, another piece of heresy, that the move from la politique to le politique, that is, everyday politics to the very meaning of the political, that move is a one-way street. With all due respect to Mouffe, Badiou, and probably Zizek, and a whole slew of others, the attempt to discover within empirical political life, that is, within la politique, the ontological essence of the political, that is, le politique, leads theory into a dead end from which there is no return to actual political practice. There is nothing to be gained by this move from the feminine to the masculine form. The post-metaphysical project of discovering ontological truth within lived existence fails politically. It fails in the socially disengaged Husserlian Heideggerian mode of bracketing uh, the existential to discover the essential nature of what the political is. And it fails in the socially critical post Foucauldian mode of historicized ontology, disclosing the multiple ways of political being in the world within particular cultural and temporal configurations. But this is not news. From the mid 1930s onward, it was Adorno's obsessive concern in the context of the rise of fascism to demonstrate the failure of the ontological attempt to ground a philosophy of being by starting with the given world, or in Heideggerian language, to move from the ontic, that is being with a small s or b, small b, ontic in the sense of that which is empirically given to the ontological, that which is essentially true of existence. 
Adorno argued that any ontology derived from the ontic turns the philosophical project into one big tautology. He has a point, and the political implications are serious. Ontology identifies. Identity was anathema to Adorno, and nowhere more so than in uh, its political implications. That is, the identity between ruler and ruled that Carl Schmitt affirmed. Indeed, even parliamentary rule can be seen to presuppose a striving for identity, whereby consensus becomes an end in itself, regardless of the truth content of that consensus. It is not that Heidegger's philosophy or any existential ontology is in itself fascist, that would be an ontological claim. Rather, by resolving the question of being before subsequent political analyses, the latter have no philosophical traction, that is, the political analyses have no philosophical traction. They are subsumed under the ontological a prioris that themselves must remain indifferent to their content. Existential ontology is mistaken in assuming that once the character of being is conceptually grasped, it will return us to the material empirical world and allow us to gather the diversities and multiplicities under philosophy's own pre-understandings uh, in ways adequate to the exigencies of collective action, the demands of political life. In fact, the ontological is never political, which would mean that a communist ontology is a contradiction in terms. But you may ask, did not Marx himself outline in his early writings a full ontology based on the classical Aristotelian claim that man is by nature a social animal? Are not the 1844 manuscripts an elaboration of that claim? <coughs> mediated by a historically specific critique, hence an extended social ontology of man's alienation from nature and from his fellow man. Yes, but in actual political life, this ontological man does not exist. Instead, we existing creatures are men and women, black and brown, capitalists and workers, gay and straight, and the meaning of these categories is in no way stable. Moreover, these differences matter less than whether we are unemployed, have prison records, or are in danger of being exported. And no matter what we are in these ontic ways, our beings strangely do not fit neatly into our politics as conservatives, anarchists, evangelicals, Tea Party supporters, Zionists, Islamists, and a few communists. We are social animals, yes, but we are also antisocial, and our animal nature is thoroughly mediated by society's contingent forms. Yes, the early Marx developed a, a philosophical ontology, but nothing follows from this politically. Philosopher King styled party leaders are not thereby legitimated, and the whole thorny issue of false consciousness cannot force a political resolution. At the same time, philosophical thought has every right and indeed obligation to intervene actively into political life. Here is Marx on the subject of intellectual practice, including the practice of philosophizing. And you know this, of course, very well, but it's often interesting to read again what you know very well. So, but again, when I'm active scientifically, et cetera, when I'm engaged in activity which I can seldom perform in direct community with others, then I am social because I am active as a man. And I don't know if it's man oder mensch in the original German, I don't know. Not only is the material of my activity given to me as a social product, as is even the language in which the thinker is active, my own existence is social activity, and therefore that which I make of myself, I make of myself for society and with the consciousness of myself as a social being. Again, no matter how deeply one thinks one's way into this ontological generalization, no specific political orientation follows. It describes the intellectual work of Heidegger and Schmidt every bit as much as it does that of Marx or of us ourselves. For, Mar for Marx, ontological philosophy was only the starting point in a lifelong practice of scientific thinking, which developed in response to the historical events that surrounded him. 
Through the trajectory of his work, the entire tradition of Western political philosophy took a left turn away from metaphysics and toward an engagement with the emerging social sciences, economics, anthropology, sociology, psychology, understood not in their positivist ga data gathering or abstract mathematical forms, but as sciences of history, not historicality, not historicity, not historicism, but concrete material history. With this hard left turn, which is an orientation that may or may not involve elements of the linguistic turn, the ethical turn, the aesthetic turn, with this hard left turn, political philosophy morphs into social theory done reflectively, that is critically. It becomes critical theory. When Marx said thinking was itself a practice, he meant it in this sense. He did not then ask, what is the ontological meaning of the being of practice? Instead, he tried to find out as much as he could about the socio-historical practices of actual human beings in his time. So the question Marx's early writings leaves us with is this. How do we turn this social fact of our work and our consciousness of this work as social beings into a communist practice or a communist practice? How are we to conceive of a communist, communist ethics? Not by the phenomenological reduction to some essence of what it is to be a social being, and I'm talking about Heidegger here, a caring being, a being to death, a being with, etc., but rather by an analysis of becoming conscious of the specific society, the specific cares, the specific deaths that are simultaneous with our own not common in the sense of the same as ours, experiences are very unequal in today's society, but is happening to others who share in common this time and this space, a space as big as the globe and a time as actual as now. Marx changed the relationship between politics and philosophy by creating a hinge out of the social sciences. This hinge has worn thin. Today's philosophically naive social sciences purport to be objective as they splinter reality into self-referential academic disciplines that argue from present-day givens as quasi-natural uh, base rather than as a dynamic, unstable structure that depends on human action. For its part, philosophy, going it alone, retreats to the humanities, to normative thinking and analysis of reason in the Kantian world of moral oughts, or alternatively, to a Nietzschean-inspired anti-rationalism, the celebration of affect, cultural relativism, liter literary narrativity, and hermeneutic contingency. Even critical philosophy shares with the positivist sciences from which it has cut itself off the presumption that it can know reality on its own. Both approaches, thought without empirical understanding and empirical understanding without thought, without critical reflection, both are extremely susceptible to reification. Meanwhile, Marxism, orphaned by both sides of the academic project, the sciences and the humanities, Marxism risks dogmatism if it claims to provide knowledge beforehand of the political meaning of events, on the basis of century-old texts fitting every empirical factoid into its pre-existing interpretive frame. As the master code of history, Marxism grants to an anthropomorphized capitalist system all powerful agency. Capitalism is said to mastermind events, exploit voraciously for private gain, delight in crisis, all the while thwarting our best moral intentions, determining historical outcomes with a cleverness far greater than any Hegelian cunning of reason could provide. Now Marx, as everyone knows, used the term capitalism only a handful of times. The big book is called Capital. And it is a critical exposure of the economic practices of his time including the processes of fetishism and reification that make it appear that the laws of capital are our necessary fate. Now I'm going to make a tedious point. 
due to the epistemological consequences, we need to reject creating an ism out of any political or theoretical orientation. No communism, no capitalism, no Marxism, no totalitarianism, no imperialism, no isms at all. These are cosmological systems, economies of belief that resemble the medieval Christological economy, economia, in that all the elements are internally consistent and logically satisfying as long as, as there is no contaminate, pardon me, as long as there is no contamination by facts or events that, like some sort of illegal aliens, enter from the outside. The simple words communist or communist, capitalist or Marxist, etc., are a different story. If they are used merely as descriptive adjectives, they refer to qualities, determinations, of objects in the world which they define. Objects that, if we are going to be consequent materialists, must have priority over the concepts we use to name them. Political practice, too, is vulnerable to seduction by the ism. It is a mistake to adopt anarchism or socialism, Trotskyism or Islamism, radicalism or parliamentarianism as a system of belief determining one's own actions in advance. Conditions change and practice needs to respond to new situations. Seize state power so as to control its ideological apparatuses? Yes, but what if, after the global transformation of capital, the state itself has become an ideological apparatus? Base one's politics on an anarchist respect for democratic agency? Absolutely, but not if that means yielding to the manipulative tactics of right-wing populism in its, in its increasingly widespread forms. To say with Althusser that Marx abandoned his early humanism for a science of history implies that Marxist science is transhistorical and eternal, an ontological first principle immune to precisely the historical specificity on which it insists, as if science were not itself historical. We have only to think of the historical limits of the science of Ricardo or Maltus or, given the present crisis, the science of the Chicago School of Economics to make that point clear. But to argue with Negri for a historical ontology based on a scientific understanding of the process of capitalist class struggle is a dubious alternative. Negri wants to add historical contingency to the mix at the same time counting on a good ontological fix to avoid the dangers of relativism that contingency implies. He does not let go of the class struggle as the prima philosophia, the philosophic first principle on which the whole political project is grounded. But if, with due respect to Negri, there can be no ontology of history, it is because history is the realm of human freedom and therefore the realm of the unpredictable. Plumpus Denken non-elegant thinking. So for example, where the elegant philosopher would discover a concept by searching for the classical Greek meaning of the word, I take my lead from modern Greek, demotiki, the street language of the people, the demos, that along with the fiscally irresponsible Greeks themselves is largely disdained by the European intelligentsia. Ta pragmata, in modern Greek, refers to the practical things that you use in daily existence. In German, the word klomotten has a little bit of this sense, the sense of being stuff. It might look like junk to others, but it is the stuff you need and use every day. Deployed in this sense, a pragmatic approach to doing theory bears a resemblance to the point that the Nigerian novelist Shoyinka made when he criticized the understanding of negritude as ontology by saying, a tiger does not proclaim his tigritude, he pounces. He later clarified, a tiger does not stand in the forest and say, I am a tiger. 
When you pass where the tiger has walked before, you see the skeleton of a duker, and you know that some tigritude has emanated there. <laughs> That's a duker. Shoyinka abandons ontology for something close to what I mean by a theoretical pragmatics. It is a practice of theorizing whereby things acquire meaning because of their practical, pragmatic relationship with other things, and these relationships are constantly open, constantly precarious. Their future cannot be predicted in advance. Now, if we were interested only in the empirical science of tiger practice, we would be behavioralists, observing from a safe distance what a tiger does. But as political actors in the midst of things, we are dukers, and dukers need to know the latest news. Can we imagine Lenin without a newspaper? Or Marx, or Hegel, for that matter. Marx wrote for newspapers about events far away from Europe, colonialism in India, the American Civil War, the Russian Mir. And Hegel was thinking the dialectic of master and slave because of the Haitian Revolution that he read about in successive issues of the political periodical Minerva. Lenin, let us remember, did not expect the revolution would happen, A, in Russia at all, B, in the summer, or even the fall of 1917. But he allowed his theory to yield to historical developments as they actually occurred. The historical event that surprises, this is the radical reality to which Lenin remained open. And here I am in total agreement with Badiou regarding the political centrality of the event, and on the same page as he, when he stresses, quote, the absolute unpredictability of the event that, quote, can be the source of the emergence of the radically new. But I would take liberties with Lacan's formulation in ways that Badiou does not. It is not truth that punches a hole in knowledge. It is social action. And the truth that such action reveals is the possibility of human freedom. So if we put together the idea of pragmatics and the idea of the event, we get a pragmatics of the suddenly possible as an expression of human freedom. And that is not a bad definition of what a communist ethics would imply. Spoken in the inelegant language of Plumpus Denken, then, the philosophically infused questions that a pragmatics of the suddenly possible would need to ask are these. What's happening? That's the pragmatic alternative to historical ontology. What's new? Is there an event going on here? What gives? in the sense of what structures of power are suddenly yielding to the actors in the event, and what's going on. Are certain structures not in the process of change? And only then do we get to the big question, what to do. And I just want to point out that I think it's only in English that sto de lat, which simply means what to do, is translated what is to be done as a way of making the whole project far more totalitarian than it was. <clears throat> so we might tarry, tarry over these questions for we might tarry over these questions for a while to view them in a communist mode. First, what's happening? The event is not a miracle that overcomes us with awe and strikes us down. It lifts us up. Precisely because it is accomplished by ordinary people who interrupt business as usual in order to act collectively, empowering not only those who are present, but those who, in watching, feel a tremendous surge of solidarity and sense of human togetherness, even, dare I say it, universality. We witness the actuality of human beings joining together to overcome barriers and initiate change. This capacity to act in common is the real possibility of a communist ethics. 
The solidarity produced in the spectator, made famous by Kant in the case of the French Revolution, has become intense, uh, intense in the electronic age. Different from Kant's time and also from Lenin's, it was television's live coverage of political action that first tipped the balance in favor of nonviolent resistance. Terror may be a political tool, but it is also a very blunt instrument historically perhaps as dated as the hydrogen bomb. In recent years, in the Iranian election protests of 2009-2010 and throughout the Jasmine revolutions of the Arab Spring, the power of nonviolent protest has multiplied exponentially. For Kant, because of the bloodiness of the French revolutionary events, it was only the idea that garnered enthusiasm. On Tahrir Square, it was the reality of peaceful force, the force of nonviolence in the face of violence, articulating a meaning of martyrdom that has universal human implications. The technological revolution of handheld internet devices has, has exploded the potential for eyewitness reporting of events. And in live time, the reporting itself becomes a weapon of resistance. Of course, how the new technologies are used depends on the hands that hold them. But what is remarkable is how reliable such information sharing has been. Human actors have taken responsibility for others in ways that risk their own personal safety, releasing what has all the appearance of a pent-up desire for non-commercial, non-self-interested information exchange and trusting the international community of viewers to respond in solidarity, and they do. So perhaps we are by nature socialist animals after all. On the first level then, what's happening is an empirical question. Approached from the mandate of a communist ethics, answering this question requires first and foremost the full freedom of communication by anyone who has knowledge to share to anyone who has the desire to know. Here, the politics that counts is of reporting by independent media so that reliable collection of news and its unfiltered, unblocked dissemination is a political project of the highest import. The more dispersed the points of observation, the fuller the picture of events will be. I am not terribly impressed with the idolization of figures like uh, Julian Assange, who has gained celebrity status and perhaps other narcissistic pleasures from his simple dumping of a mass of private documents. To say that his dumping of Pentagon Papers sparked the Tunisian Revolution, and I've heard that claim, is a bit like crediting Ronald Reagan for the fall of the Berlin Wall. Such an act is far more likely to be politically useful as an excuse for the so-called democratic governments to implement control of the internet, against which, of course, in this particular case, Assange must be defended. The effects of government regulation have already been felt in China, where the government blocked Facebook and Twitter as detrimental to Chinese national interests. Google refused to comply and moved its towers to Hong Kong, leaving the Chinese uh, domestic search and engine space to expand. Um, incidentally, in my opinion, Steve Jobs' life is about the US benefiting from immigration. His grandfather was a Syrian Muslim. But while he is praised as a hero of free enterprise, his crucial political contribution is the fact that in developing the personal computer, he gave people control over the means of production of the global economy. And that's a communist act, if there ever was one. On the second level, what's happening is an act of interpretation. To know what is happening beyond the virtually mediated sense perception, which when it means seeing videos of, brutally, of brutality toward unarmed protesters is most unanimously and universally opposed uh, as a moment in the event. Um, to know what is happening is to name the action and place it in context. It is here that the difficult, often contentious, hermeneutic work of political analysis begins and this on the most basic level. 
What are we to call this moment of citizen action? Is it democracy we are witnessing? Yes, surely. But by calling it this, we already seem to suggest the trajectory of events. Success then means founding political parties, holding elections, and declaring loyalty to a secular nation state that plays by the predetermined rules of the given world order. In other words, that which is suddenly possible in an event is to follow the lead of the self-proclaimed democracies in countries that have already arrived. But none of those steps necessarily follows from what has happened, which, of course, for the old self-proclaimed democracies is a, calm, is a cause of alarm. The known steps, the ones they have taken, reduce the meaning of the suddenly possible to a pre-written script if we then revisit the question, what's new, the answer ends up being not much. But what if the truly eventful social action initiated in Tunis, Cairo, and elsewhere is a previously unimagined structure of politics, not the universal one-size-fits-all relevance of nation-state democracy, which, even allowing for the differences of culturally pluralistic contexts, presumes an et eternal verity to the two-century-old Euro-American forums, forms which at present are responding rather badly to the global economic crisis that their own economic institutions caused. What if it's not that? But what if it is instead a glimpse of global solidarity wherein national and cultural identity are suspended and unity is the consequence not of who you are, but of what you do. Let us call this a communist practice. The whole process of the act of protest and its virtual dissemination is in its non-exclusionary horizontal organizational forms a brilliant manifestation of a brand new communist ethic pointing to the suddenly possible power of global solidarity. This is the new that reveals itself in the event, an event that is less a rupture than an opening, an opening for something new to emerge. And here I want to point out that we can talk about a state of emergency uh, in the 16th century meaning of the word emergency, which is emerging, a state of emerging. Right. You knew I was going to get there. Finally, on September 28th, the New York Times brought to mainstream media the biggest political story of the year, officially acknowledging what has been happening all along. A front page story put together the global pieces. The Arab Spring, India supporting Anna Hazara's hunger strike, Israeli citizens uh, in pro-justice protests in Tel Aviv, days of rioting in Athens and London, the Madrid Indignados de la República, as well as citizen sleep-ins uh, of the excluded that are going on in civic spaces from Tahrir Square to the Plaza del Sol to Wall Street. And we need to add the amazing bravery of citizens in Syria, Yemen, and Bahrain, who, with no help from NATO, persist in the face of violent repression by their governments, the legitimacy of which they steadfastly refuse to recognize. Arab Spring, European Summer, Wall Street or Wall Street plus fall. This is a global social movement that affirms diversity and universality both at once. Clearly it is radical refusing to accept the given rules of the game. Is it a turn to the left? Perhaps this nomenclature no, can no longer be used, and this fact, too, is what's new. In our cyber-geographical situation, left turns are positioned differently on the ground. They are local in orientation, and they are necessarily plural. This, among many things, separates global communist, communist action from right-wing populism where the latter marshals anger at the global disorder in support of neo-nationalism, free market privatization, and anti-immigration, 
co-opting grassroots roots movements into existing political parties, the translocal constellations of forces refuses to be nationally contained. For left and right to make any sense, there have to be borders, territorial borders between nations and partisan borders within them. The new activists seem to be unwilling to be seduced by the rhetoric of divide and rule. Are they impractically naive? Is this an event at all? What gives? Walls fall, tyrants fall, an African-American immigrant son is elected president of the United States. But what goes on? What continues through these transformations? When Warren Buffett proclaimed speaking the truth from power, there's class warfare all right and we're winning, he could have added worldwide. In a meeting like ours today where we are considering politics from a new beginning, the 600 pound gorilla in the room is radical politics past. It's debt to Marx's analysis that dealt intensely with economic inequality, outlining a theory of capital and global exploitation of land and labor, a dialectical history of class struggle, and a rationale for the necessity of political revolution in order for human society to move forward. Never in my lifetime has the Marxist critique of capital and its global dynamics seemed so accurate. And never has it seemed so wrong to go back to Marxism in its historical forms. At least since the 19, pardon me, at least through the 1960s, Marxist theory was the lingua franca of activists globally, no matter how much they disagreed on the proper interpretation, Soviet, Maoist, humanist, etc. The fall of the Soviet Union and the adoption of capitalist elements by the Republic of China dealt a fatal blow to this commonality. Marxism as a theory could not withstand the scrutiny of feminist, post-colonial, critical race theorists and others who extended the meaning of oppression and exploitation far beyond what happens on the factory floor. In its definition of human universality, Marxism was provincial at best and its logic, often determinist, was firmly lodged in a theory of historical stages that has been shown to be simply inaccurate by Samir Amin, Janet Abu Lagood, and Dapesh Chakrabarti, to name a few. And the idea of the revolutionary proletariat? Is the working class as political vanguard still relevant as an organizational form? Official unions, not all of them, but too many and too often, have behaved as groups that do not rise above economist concerns. Labor protests continue to matter in innovative ways. From Suez, Egypt, where non-official unions were crucial for empowering the Tahrir activists by their own power to block the Suez Canal, to Xintang, China, where migrant workers took to the streets to protest against being denied access to basic citizen rights, to Madison, Wisconsin, where the very right to collective bargaining was under attack, to the workers' councils and other labor groups that came to occupy Wall Street last week in support. Labor organizing remains uh, a, cr a crucially important location of political struggle. But not only are most of the jobs in most places in the world non-union, the reasons Marx argued for the pivotal importance of the organized working class may no longer hold. The wage rate as variable capital was supposed to be the part of the cost equation in the production process that lent itself to downward pressures as opposed to the fixed capital of machines. But as we have seen, it functions by a different logic when productivity eliminates jobs completely. The generation of the unemployed youth today worldwide fears less the status of, a, of joining a necessary labor reserve army than of being unnecessary, economically superfluous. And that is a really scary part of what's new. As the mega cities of the globe make evident, massive proletarianization of the workforce has indeed taken place. But factories have left the cities and moved to the enclaves and even as temporary 
illegal migrant workforces have shown themselves remarkably capable of collective action, despite their precarious position and despite ethnic and linguistic differences, their own cosmopolitan consciousness is far in advance of what has been achieved by nationally organized political parties. Where is the revolutionary class? This may be the wrong question to ask. Perhaps neither category, neither revolution nor class, has the necessary traction for our time. First, is societal transformation any longer about revolution in the classical modern sense? It has long been my suspicion that the Iranian revolution of 1979 was the last in a long line that has run its course, whether in its pro-nationalist or anti-colonial or Marxist or theocratic forms. Khomeini's Vilayat al-Faqi was a personal invention. This is the way the, the uh, elders of the faith rule was a personal invention, foreign not only to Western traditions, but also to Sunni Islam and even Shiite political thought. And yet his triumph in a violent civil war has affinities with the French revolutionary prototype in many of its distinguishing characteristics, and they are prolonged fratricide, tens of thousands of political executions, including the ritualistic beheadings of political enemies before the public, a tradition of increasing radicalism, a reign of virtue, a Thermidorian reaction of authoritarian centralization, and finally, a Girondist foreign policy of revolutionary expansion. But if you can spread revolution by twittering your triumph to the world, why bother with the expense of foreign invasion? Today, the videotaped beheadings of random victims does not have the same effect on a global public as regicide on the crowd of citizens on the Place de la Place de la Revolution. It is not felt by the global public as justified revenge. As is the case with the bombing of civilians, the bulldozing of houses, and the torturing and humiliation of prisoners, it is perceived as brutal and wrong. Abstraction here works dialectically. Without the legitimating language of the perpetrators, without the contextual pre-given meanings, the viewing of violence toward the powerless evokes empathy from global observers who, precisely because the scene is taken out of context, respond on a visceral level, concretely, and with empathy. Fratricide, the bloody struggle of civil war as the means of social transformation, is short-sighted as the truth and reconciliation process that must follow proves enormously difficult. And as ther Thermidorian reactions make clear, it is far easier to smash the old order than to construct the new one. So much for violent revolution. But are we really done with class? The 100-pound gorilla is still with us. And in fact, pardon me, the fact that in this global capitalist world, Virtually across the board geopolitically, the rich keep getting richer and the poor poorer. And those in control of the global world order, far from protesting, tell us that this system needs to be given special protection, far greater than that given to the citizens themselves. Free markets, otherwise known as uncontrolled capitalist accumulation, and free societies, democracies Western style, have joined hands and the end product is global oligarchy. The so-called community of nations protects a global system of enclosures that works to appropriate every use value that can be turned into a profit-making endeavor. Nothing, not schools, not prisons, not human genes, not wild plants, not the national army, not foreign governments, nothing is exempt from this process of privatization. So there is class warfare being waged from the top down. But is there class war? Only if the rest of the world, the 99%, responds in kind. Even Warren Buffett is not happy with the role he is supposed to play. I want to oppose the idea that the whole point of politics is to name the enemy, Schmittian style and to structure one's political organizing in an instrumental way in order to defeat that enemy. 
Agonistic politics is mutually dependent, is, is a mutually dependent social relationship. Both sides must play the game. And perhaps nothing would appeal to those believing that the bad old is better than the possibility of the new good than if this struggle were to be defined as class war. Perhaps nothing would make the authorities more relieved than if the Occupy Wall Street movement became violent because the state can justify putting down violence by force. But the vast majority, the 99%, has the force they need in sheer numbers and does not need armed struggle to prove that point. And the point is this. The system upon which we depend, the system that is incorporating more and more of our world, is not only out of control, it is punishing, irrational, and immoral. In bad use words, brutal and barbaric. A world community of democratic and sovereign nation states was supposed to be the end of history, not the end of humanity. But what are we to make of a world based on absurd contradictions in which the democratically elected parliament of Greece taxes the people into destitution in order to save the nation? Or the nation of Iraq is liberated by the destruction of its infrastructure and death or displacement of 20% of the population. The logic has indeed something fundamentally in common with that of the Cold War, when the capacity to destroy the world was the gold standard of military security, and when post-colonial village, villages in Vietnam were bombed into oblivion in order to save their inhabitants from going communist. This is the acceptable social behavior, and it is crazy. It produces a new tautology, and this is my only bow toward religion, I suppose, it produces a new tautology where the spirit of capitalism produces the capitalist ethic that produces the spirit of capitalism that produces the capitalist ethic. <clears throat> the, glow of optimism felt the glow of optimism felt worldwide when Barack Obama won the US presidency in 2008 was a last and lost chance to believe that the system was capable of writing itself. In Obama's loyalty to the two pillars of the world order, capitalist economics and national self-interest, Obama's presidency has demonstrated the bankruptcy of both. Given that free markets and a free society have failed to deliver basic human needs, can the world's citizens be asked to hope again? Of course, and I'm going to tell now a joke because everyone feels when Slavo is here we have to tell a joke, and I will. Of um, course, the analogy is exaggerated and the political emer emergency is qualitatively different. Obama is happily not a fascist and sadly not socialist enough. But one is reminded of an exchange between Albert Speer and Hitler in March 1945 as the Red Army closed in on Berlin. Hitler was enraged to discover Speer had blocked his orders, but then calmed down and said, and I'm quoting Speer in a relaxed tone, Speer, if you can convince yourself that the war is not lost, you can continue to run your office. And he says, you know, I cannot be convinced of that. The war is lost. Hitler then launched into his reflections of the other difficult situations in his life, situations in which all had seemed lost, but which he had mastered. He surprisingly lowered his demand. If you would believe that the war could still be won, if you could at least have faith in that, all would be well. Agitated, I said, quote, oh, this is, of course, all spear, I cannot with the best will in the world. Once again, Hitler reduced his demand to a formal profession of faith. If you could at least hope that we had not lost, you must certainly be able to hope. That would be enough to satisfy me. I did not answer. There was a long, awkward pause. At last, Hitler stood up abruptly, quote, you have 24 hours to think over your answer. Tomorrow, let me know whether you hope that the war can still be won. And with that, without shaking hands, he dismissed me. Again, the point of comparison is not one of leadership. It is only to point out that hope too, can be an ideology. I cannot help fe feeling that Obama himself is aware of this danger, 
surely having believed in the democratic process that brought him to electoral victory such a short time ago. Obama was fond of repeating, quote, this is not about me. And he was precisely correct. It was not. But he himself lacked faith in the people who elected him. Obama is proud to call himself a pragmatist. He just forgot one thing. In attempting to be realistic within the confines of the crazy status quo, he betrayed the pragmatics of the suddenly possible, which is, after all, the force that elected him in the first place. It is a global force, and it desperately wants change. It is the only sane politics the world now has. Will the world's leaders recognize this fact? Will they be able to see that the system they stand on is bankrupt and their power rests on air? So in conclusion, what to do? The Egyptian feminist Nawal Sadawi responded to this question, what to do, last spring saying, make your own revolution. The ways forward will be as varied as the people of this world. Feminists globally have taught us the need for such variety. And all of these ways deserve our spectatorship, our support, and our solidarity. We, the 99%, must refuse to become invisible to each other. The experiments that are going on now in thousands of locations need space, the space that Walter Benjamin called Spielraum, a place of play, of experiment, to try doing things differently. And they need time, the slowing of time, the pulling of the emergency brake, so that something new can emerge. This is the time that state power wants to cut short, and space that old-style political parties want to foreclose. There is no rush. The slowing of time is itself the new beginning. Badiou's comments yesterday were right to the point here. Every day that this event continues, it performs the possibility that the world can be otherwise. Against the hegemony of the present world order that passes itself off as natural and necessary, global actors are tearing a hole in knowledge. New forms emerge. They nourish our imagination, the most radical power that we as humans have. Thank you.